Again, I'm amazed though, every aspect of the songs, the scripture, meshes together. You will find elements of everything that's been done so far written into this sermon. And the funny thing about it is, we don't really talk about it. It's the Spirit that leads and, and gives us that um, guidance. And I'm convinced of that. We'll be reading today from uh, Revelation chapter 21. I'm sorry, it was a uh, short week um, with additional responsibilities and I didn't put together a PowerPoint slide. So I just want to let you know that. If you will, though, follow in your Bible. Um, if you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew rack in front of you. But uh, let's read together a portion of what we're going to talk about today. And this is Revelation 21. And we're going to read verses 9 through 14. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very valuable stone like a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels and names were written on the gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer before we start the sermon. Father God, we just want to thank you how even in singing, we proclaim we're washed by your blood. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for we want to see you glorified, high and mighty, lifted up. So, Father, today we come seeking guidance, seeking inspiration, seeking instruction from your word. And I pray, Father, that it is your word that gets taught here in this church. That the words that I say may be accumulation of my studies and of my meditations. But, Father, the message is from you. Biblical, scriptural, foundational. So, Father, I just pray as we sit for this next period of time that we would focus on you and let the distractions of the world slip away. Give us a, a, a view of who you are. And we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. I would be... You're missed if I didn't mention that uh, this is Clyde and Jones' final week with us. So all of you, make sure you touch base with them. Tell them how much they'll be missed, how much they're loved. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing them again next year, Lord willing. Christians don't ever say goodbye, do they? No, they don't. Even, even in a memorial for Floyd. We aren't saying goodbye to her. We're just recognizing as a celebration of life. And we will see her again. And we're confident of that. So let's recap a little bit. We're getting so close to the end of Revelation. So close. You can see it from here. <laughs> Literally in heaven in this time frame. We might be seeing this soon. But anyways, we talked about last week, all things new, if you remember. And if you have paper and pencil, I recommend take notes. Uh, there's a few things in here that may lend to be a very good outline. Um, but something may speak to you and you may want to revisit it later. So I always encourage you to take notes. Um, 
we talked about all things new. We had a, a new heaven and earth, new Jerusalem, a new relationship with God. And we actually held off about speaking about the Holy City because we wanted to focus on that today. So as we get ready to jump into this, let me ask you a question. In this passage, Revelation 21, is it about the millennial kingdom when you read it? Or is it about the eternal state? Because some very good men on both sides have, uh, of doctrine are on both sides of this. But I want to say that to take a look at this, I've clearly come up with a de decision that it's the eternal state that's being spoken here. And let me just give you three reasons why I say so. In the millennium, there's an earthly Jerusalem and a temple in which they offer sacrifices. Here today, when we read this passage, you'll see there's no physical temple mentioned here. During the millennium, God made all things bountiful. During the eternal state, all things will be made new. A person actually can die in the millennium. And it's, it's a shame, it's a, it's a tragedy for them to do so. But in the eternal state, there'll be no more death, tears, sickness, or pain. So when we read this passage, put that in your mind. We're talking about eternity here. And that's a very long time. Verse 1, we mentioned the new heaven, the new earth that was created because this current version of our universe and our world passes away. It's destroyed. And the new Jerusalem descends from God's heaven. New that communicates a new cosmos. Not just an ethical renovation or transformation of what's here, but a fundamental change in the structure of our universe, including the physical elements. It's all new. Let me remind you, reading 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, where it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works, the earth and its works will be burned up. The New American Standard 2020 version says, Its works will be discovered. What does that mean? be discovered. Well, it's going to be revealed. God's going to reveal this world. And they're going to judge the, the whole world as worthless and then burned up. And the New Living Translation says it this way, the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. So notice even just how looking at three different versions of the Bible will help you round out the message, the meaning of what's being said. It can give you a perspective by doing so because you're not just looking at one version. So I recommend that you, you grow your Bible knowledge by reading more than one version, trustworthy versions. And in doing so, you're going to be enhancing your experience, your personal experience with God. Then next in the sequence in verse 2, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. The holy city as a bride made ready for her husband. Husbands, I have a question. Do you remember that moment when your bride appeared and then began to walk down the aisle? Is that burned into your head? He, even if you don't remember, you better tell her you do. Okay? <laughs> it's important. But we're looking at that. We're looking at a creation of, that God has made for His glory to be existing in made with us in mind. 
That is quite an entrance. And when I read this passage, I remember Jesus' words in John 14, verse 2, where he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. A place where one, as you see in verse 3, God will tabernacle among his people. There's a new location here. Two, as you see in verse 4, no more tears, death, mourning, crying, or pain. That's a new order. And the third aspect, a place, as it says in verse 6, where we're given water of life without cost. Our spiritual thirst satisfied. That's what Jesus is preparing for us. For those who overcome, like it says in verse 7, will inherit these things. Speaking about inheritance, I wanted to go back to Abraham. Abraham given the covenant promise of a land, a people, a progeny. In Hebrews chapter 11, if you want to turn there, Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham is mentioned here, going out to a place where he would receive an inheritance. And we read how he went all the way from Ur to Canaan. And even though this was the promised land, that the book of Hebrews says he was looking forward to something eternal. Let's read verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs with the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. I believe this is a transition from the physical promise to the eternal promise that God gave Abraham. Sit with this. Abraham was looking past the earthly promises toward the heavenly promises that God gave him. He focused, he chose to focus on the eternal, not the temporal. He was obedient where he was at each day, but he focused on the eternal. I just kind of think there might be a life lesson in here for us today on this. But back in Revelation 21, verse 11, we're talking about the city having the glory of God and her brilliance like a very costly stone, a stone crystal clear jasper. So the question is, how do you describe the glory of God? It's kind of hard to describe the glory of God. I think you take and you compare it to the purest form of the rarest item that you can think of and try to do it justice. The author mentions gemstones and gold describing their purity, their brilliance, and their value. And really adding an extra quality that, honestly, I've never seen. Clear, glistening gold. Verse 8 says it's pure gold like, or let's see, verse 18 says it's pure gold like clear glass. I've not seen gold like this, not yet. Anyways, I will. So, gemstones, gold, these have a universal appeal because of value. They've always been items of value throughout the ages. That's why we can identify with it. Then in verse 12, the external appearance is equally striking in size, the length, the width, height, all 
1,500 miles. Your version may say 12,000 stadia. My version says 1,500 miles. By human and angelic measurements. Sometimes scholars try to decide, hey, is this talking about a square or a cube or, or a triangle like a pyramid? I myself have no opinion. There's not enough information in scripture to come to that conclusion. I just want to focus on the size. And checking on the internet, I looked at it. I said, how does this compare? Well, if you were to take a a square or a block 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles and place it over the United States, it would easily cover two-thirds of the United States. And this is a big city. And you move that cube over to Israel and it's over the whole Sinai Peninsula. It covers it all. That's a big city. And there's 12 gates, three on each of the four sides. And I thought about it because Scripture gives you quite a description of these gates. So I have five key thoughts about this. There's an angel, first of all, at each gate. Angels provide security as guards. Each gate has a name one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. That means they have identity. Verse 21 says each gate is constructed out of a single pearl. It speaks to the value, how valuable they are. When I was thinking about this, I, I kind of just rolled my mind back to Matthew chapter 13 where it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold everything that he had and bought it. In my mind, God is welcoming us through into the city through the pearl of great price. When you enter in, there's a value to that. Verse 25 says these gates will never be closed because in the Old Testament, to protect the city, the gates were closed at night. And if you showed up late, you had to wait outside the gate until the morning when it was opened. Here, the gates are never closed. There's accessibility to God. And there's an exclusivity to it also, because verse 27 mentions that only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life may enter. Security, identity, value, or valuable. Accessibility and exclusivity. These are the same qualities that we have here and now in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, verse 35 mentions or says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? That's security. Ephesians 2, 19 says, you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. That's your identity. Jesus said, do not be worried about your life. Are you not more valuable than these, as he points out, Matthew 6, 25. Ephesians 2, 18 also says, for through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father, accessibility. And our exclusiveness of the relationship is Ephesians 1, 4, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. As a Christian, you can claim that. You can identify with that. Back to our walls, though. Verse 14. 
The foundation stones of this wall are labeled with the names of the 12 apostles. And remember, back in Ephesians 2, when Paul is writing verses 19 through 22, he says that we have the same description for our church, that the foundation was laid by the apostles and prophets, Christ being the cornerstone. The church as a building of believers has the same foundation as the foundation of this city. Foundations must be pretty important to God that he brings these out, mentions them. Make sure your foundation is the same. Make sure your faith is built on the truth, on scripture, because you want to ensure the structure of your building, of your faith. Because when the trials hit, and they will, when suffering and persecution happens in your life, and it will, you want to make sure you stand strong on that foundation. You're not knocked off. You have to have a solid foundation and build it in God, in Christ. And then again, I notice these walls are huge. Verse 17, the walls are measured, and they come in at 72 yards. 72 yards. Now, I was thinking about that. Well, that's not so high, uh, three-quarters of a football field. And then I came to realize it was talking about the depth of the wall, 72 yards. Oh, that's a whole different story. I'm glad I paid attention. Because walls, besides adding protection in the Old Testament, back then people also lived in the walls when the city walls were thick enough. Like Jericho. Rahab, her family had this kind of setup. In Joshua chapter 2, in verse 15, it states, Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall so that she was living on the wall. Not sure about the purpose of the walls being so thick in uh, the New Jerusalem, but it does make me kind of excited about this. What will be happening in this city? Well, I have a dwelling place tucked away into the wall there. Doesn't say, but I like to think those things. The construction of the materials of the walls are mentioned, but their purpose not really talked about. But the materials, let's look at verse 18. Having the walls constructed of jasper and the city itself pure gold, I come to the conclusion that these are not materials we currently possess because gold is not clear as glass. But God can do whatever he wants because he's God. And if he wants to introduce something new at this time and fit for his abode, so be it. But I do notice in verse 22 that there's no temple here in this city. The earthly temple, the one during the tribulation period, is yet to be built. The Muslim shrine, the Dome of the Rock, currently sits on the, the original temple site. So something's got to happen from here today until the tribulation and into the tribulation where this temple is rebuilt. But then when the heavens and earth are destroyed, there will not be a need for a temple. But what we do have, as it mentions here, the Almighty the sovereign and omnipotent God. We have Him. His holiness satisfied. No need for any more sacrifices. Because why? We also have the Lamb. The Lamb of God. The final sacrifice bringing reconciliation, redemption, and reward to us. Reconciliation. What does that mean? 
to be reconciled is to be made at peace again. And I want to point out in Scripture, it's always man being reconciled to God. God has no need to be reconciled to us. He has not offended us. Man, on the other hand, all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Man, unrepentant, stands in judgment of God until he's reconciled. Until he repents, does the about face, and comes to the Lord. But to be reconciled, especially in even human relationships, it means you're at peace with one another. And that's important, to have peace with one another. We also, because of the Lamb's sacrifice, have redemption. Redemption, having been bought out from the slave market. Unredeemed man is chained, bound, until the love of God pierces that heart. You respond in faith, and then the shackles fall off because of the sacrifice of the Lamb. And there's a reward in this as well. Being born again means we have, we're a new creation, and we have a new family, a new inheritance. A lot of cool things happen when you're born again. And the Lamb is Jesus. Doesn't say his name at this point, so let's look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. So turn in your Bible, Revelation chapter 1. And it reads, To him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he made us into a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And this is directly talking about Christ when you look at the, the context in which it's in. The, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's who we're talking about. And what did he do? He loved us. Let me read you the same passage I just read you. And I'm calling this Pastor Jim's expanded version. To him who loves us with agape pure love and released us set free, unshackled from our sins by his blood, the shedding of his blood poured out his sacrificial death. And he made us, he made us, he fashioned us, he created us, he built in us and generated something new. He made us into a kingdom together, more than a family, all in a royal relationship with him. Priests, priests with access to and serving him, to his God and Father, the Almighty, the Almighty, high and lifted up, because it says to him be the glory. To give God glory is to highly regard, to raise him up, to give him the hallelujah. So we clearly see his divine presence. To him be the glory and the dominion. God gets all the greatness, all the fame, all the honor, forever and ever. We don't get that. We receive it from him and we give it back to him. We cast our crowns at his feet in worship. Forever and ever, amen. Amen, let it be so. That's how that verse reads to me. And when you read over scripture, when you run past it so fast that you don't even pause on the thoughts that it's giving you, we do it a great disservice. I would much rather have a devotion of one verse like this than to read a whole chapter. Because it's gotta leave a mark. When you spend time with God, People should know it. Moses spent time with God 
and the people knew it. He shone in brilliance. And why not us? We spend time with God. Shouldn't we show it? Shouldn't we shine for Jesus in the same way? Well, maybe not the same way, but people should know you. They, the apostles were approached in Acts, and it says the people came and saw them, and they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. How does that happen? They had been with Jesus because their character, their conduct, their love for one another showed forth. I hate to be the bad guy, but when you look back at this week, can you have people identify and say, I saw him, I saw her. That's a person that's been with Jesus. We can't be a secret anymore. Our faith is not to be hidden under a bushel. The lines have been drawn in society. Stand for what you believe. You've got the foundation. You've got everything God's given to you as we've talked about. It's time to shine. And there is no sun or moon here in this new Jerusalem. The glory of God has illumined the city. Its lamp is the Lamb, verse 23. Verses 23 through 26 actually parallel Isaiah chapter 60. The prophecy, the themes of Isaiah are written here by the Apostle John in Revelation. Let me pick out a few verses. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 19. And as you're looking at verses 23 through 26, you can identify this. Verse 19, Isaiah 60 says, No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor will the moon give you light for brightness, but you will have the Lord as an everlasting light and your God as your glory. Isaiah 63 says, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. The kings, the nations themselves will continue to come to God and bring the wealth as an offering to him. Verse 11, chapter 60 of Isaiah says, Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed by day or night so that people may bring you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. And this is the culmination of the grand theme of mankind. The grand theme being creation, fall, salvation, deliverance, and security into eternity. That's the, mic, the mac, no, micro, right? The big picture, not the little picture. From creation to eternity, God's story. Next week, we'll conclude our study in Revelation, I think. But let me ask you, isn't it a comfort to know that God is in control? That we, though, have to have faith in Him. It's not automatic to have a relationship with God. But we have to have faith. And then when we have faith, we have to trust in His agenda. No matter how harmful it seems right now in life, we have to understand that it's God's agenda and how we react, how we act and how we react are important because there is a world of hurting people. Have you been hurting throughout coronavirus? Have you been hurting? Have you lost work? Have you lost relationships? Have you lost the opportunity to be with family, your friends? and how you felt about that, then multiply that by a person that doesn't have faith in God. And that's why we're here. That's why God has not pulled us out of this world yet. We have a job. We have a, he has a plan for us. We have that responsibility. So we have to commit to his plan, not our own. 
So when will this happen? Do I have a date? Apparently, I don't, but uh, I would have thought it had happened by now, rapture, and then entering the tribulation and the millennial kingdom. But it's all in the future. But it's close. But the only thing we can control is today, our present, how we respond to trials and persecution. Trust in God, first of all. Trust in God. Be ironclad. You know, I was talking to somebody this week about how kids try and manipulate parents by using one against the other and you know I know it didn't happen in your family or it doesn't happen in your family but you know the kids they know if they can get on the side of one parent to get their way over that parents have to be ironclad together they have to be bulletproof and stand as a united force against those kids in the same way we have to be bulletproof with our faith know what you believe and then live what you believe. Belong to something bigger than yourself. Connect. I'm so happy to see so many people coming back to church. Welcome, guys. I've missed you. I want to encourage everybody. There's nothing better than a, a chorus of singing over a hymn or a song. Come on back. It's okay. We're doing it right. Together we are that church. We're set on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ being the cornerstone. And together, I am very confident we can do this. Together we can serve God. We can love one another and be God's hands and heart to a community because that community still needs God. We don't know who of our neighbors will respond unless we reach out, make ourselves a little bit more vulnerable, be a church without walls. So today, as we wrap this up, the question is, how is God guiding you? Where is he leading you to serve, to fellowship? Coming out of con the coronavirus and the restrictions, that means we have to open back up. And our leadership can't do it alone. We need each member of the church. In a minute here, after our last song, we're going to invite Mike Leonard up here and we're going to accept him as a member of our fellowship today. That's something he, he doesn't take lightly. And we were talking earlier about how he's looking forward to God using him through our church. And that's what it's all about. Because we can't do it alone. Let's close in prayer here as the band comes back up. Father God, we just want to commit to you the words of this passage. Oh, I'm aching for to see the glory of God. To, to have access to the holy city. To experience that relationship anew. Get, you've given us so much, God. You've, you've provided for our daily needs. You've provided for our eternal needs. Through Christ, the Lamb. We've been purchased by that blood and that is very costly amazingly free to us to accept but at the cost of your son so father today I just pray for a recommitment of our hearts every one of us Lord to to make a decision to follow you closer to be stronger in our faith, to be more open and welcoming, loving. They will know we are Christians by our love, not by how much we give, not by how many verses we can quote, 
or our attendance or posts on Facebook. But when they see that love, that agape love, pure, accepting, vulnerable, give that to us, Lord. Give us our, our life back, our, our fellowship back. Give us our ability to serve one another. Bring it back into our life. Activate us, Lord. If we've been waiting, now's the time. Today's the day. Thank you, Jesus, for not counting us out, for not discarding us, but abiding with us. May this week be an overcoming week as we live out our faith in you. It's your wonderful name we pray, Jesus. Amen.